In a turbulent, digitalizing, uncertain world, making sense of the future is more important than ever. But what questions should we be asking and what answers do we hope to hear? Timon de Jong is a world-renowned behavioral expert, author and keynote speaker who helps organizations to become future-proof by using a combination of academic research, entertaining insights and practical takeaways. He's joining me today to talk about the world we're operating in, how to navigate the poly crisis, and the human side of future tech. These are big topics, and hopefully during this episode, we'll unpack what this practically means for leaders and organisations today. So, Timon, welcome to In Good Company. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Well, uh, a lot of that introduction is off your bio, which is uh, <laughs> which is probably why it's so good. So, yeah, thank you for writing it yourself, which is really yeah, good. Yeah, but you added it a bit around, so it sounds better than my 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 own bio, I think. Oh, so, well, good. Yeah, well done. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, there we go. It's a delight to have you here, and thank you for joining us. And um, uh, I, first, first, it's um, it would be good to get a bit of an introduction from you to to give our audience a bit of uh, an insight into who you are. And uh, so, we asked the same question to. I guess, which is to okay. tell us about yourself in 60 seconds. Yeah. All right. Starting now. Go for it. All right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, Timo de Jong, um, social psychologist. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a people person, people researcher, um, specializing in the future of human behavior. So trying to predict with as much research as possible how people are going to behave in the near future. So three to five, sometimes 10 years. So it doesn't get to sci-fi. Um, I run my own little think tank called Weston, lecture at Utrecht University. Um, I do keynotes, leadership training, and stand in, groups, stand in front of groups of students. So everything I do these days is in front of people. Uh, I play bass guitar in a rock band as a nice. side hustle, <clears throat> mountain biking, open water swimming, and I have a wonderful family uh, live in Amsterdam. Kids, nine and 11. Um, <laughs> And then I think, yeah, th those are the most important things in my life, with the last ones being the most important. <laughs> course, uh, and that's a yeah. minute. That's a minute. Yeah, right. I think you did pretty well. I think you did pretty well. We, um, we're, we're, we're actually, uh, confession time, we're usually pretty open to those going over 60 seconds, but you did really well. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, and of course, we've met before. So we were just chatting before we hit record uh, that you have been a keynote speaker at our um, learning event that we used to run, which was LearnFest. Uh, I miss LearnFest so much. Can I yeah, reminisce it? Of so course, please do. I've been running my own think tank now for 10 years, and I've recently made a list where I hand out <laughs> awards, uh, just, you know, just as a joke, to the best conference, best audience, best, you know, uh, client, the best, uh, everything, craziest thing happened. And actually, LearnFest, been there twice, my favorite uh, conference uh, I've been to. Uh, and I actually, you know, if, if people ask me for, for input in how can we organize our conference, our, our away days better, I always refer back to LearnFest as being a combination between a co conference and a festival, yeah. and especially in the location that you've had. And it just... Um, you know, me and I've been there with a colleague also once. We, we wanted, you know, we 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 wanted back, and we'll be there. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, yeah, as you can, as everybody can imagine, the it it, it sort of came to a halt during covid the covid year uh last year that we ran it was 2019 so if there's uh if there's an appetite for it then we'll definitely my be, um, fav at, conference from agenda. from a speaker uh, point of view oh yes. well that's very kind and uh, i'm sure the organizers will be delighted to hear that <laughs> um so thank you ever so much yeah learn fest was cracking and i and i like like yourself miss it so i'm, I'm hoping to to see it again very soon which would be great um, so we'd better get talking about our topic for today. Um, so one of the things, one of the words that I used in the intro uh, was the, an, a, a term that I know you know a lot about. I didn't, which was polycrisis. Um, so I, I assume I'm not alone in not understanding or knowing or have even heard of the term polycrisis. So, uh, and I certainly didn't know we were living through one. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, but let's find out a bit more about it. So can you explain the term and the key uh, components of the current global poly crisis? Yes, it's it's a word people like me, sociologists, social psychologists, use to describe the current state of the world. It's also known as a <laughs> perma crisis or meta crisis, if you would like to look it up. And it's a word we use to describe uh, the state of the world where it's, 
uh, definitely from a people perspective, feels like all these crises are coming at the same time or all these crises are rapidly following each other. Um, they're interconnected. Yeah. Um, and it feels like we, 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 we haven't gotten a break. Uh, like with single crisis, we get, we get a crisis, then we get time to recuperate, and then there's another crisis because there's crisis all the time. But now, poly crisis started with COVID, the, the the multiple waves of COVID, and then you know we 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 didn't get a break, and we're straight into Ukraine uh, war, straight into an energy crisis, inflation, cost of living crisis, mental health crisis. Of course, the climate crisis was ongoing, but it yeah. you know it, it it keeps coming back and and forward it onto our radar. Uh, of course, Israel and Gaza is the latest addition to the poly crisis, and and uh, it, it overwhelms people, and people feel numb. And the uh, I, I look at it from a people perspective. You also have the 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 uh, the, the the academic. Uh, uh, historical perspective and people look at this and, and actually look at how are these crises all connected and do they reinforce each other as well. But that's a bit more zooming out. I look at the effect the poly crisis has on uh, behavior and then specifically for organizations, professionals, leaders. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? When you, when you really boil down and actually take a moment to think about what is going on in the world. And there are so many, as you say, crises that are going on. And so, yeah, it does. It doesn't surprise me that there is a term that that <laughs> it sort of culminates it all together and brings it all together. Um, what are you kind of uh, seeing at the moment? Is like, um, I, I suppose the the key trends of of what you're seeing, and what is in you mentioned about um, the behaviours towards it. What are you seeing is like the key ones. I guess anxiety is a big one. Yeah, definitely. So there are a few things that stand out, and and it's it's good to point out that being in a poly crisis is different than being in a single crisis, like the, the like when when COVID just happened. So there 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 are three things that uh, stand out, and the first one is a mix of positive and negative emotions. Um, and it's positive in the sense that you know I'm still here, I'm hanging in here, everything is happening around me, and I'm still here. But oh. You know, you open your news up, it's one crisis, and one crisis, and one crisis. So uh, people, are, you know, we're hanging in here, you know, we're hanging in there. Uh, we're, we're still okay. I'm still alive. I'm still, I'm talking this part of, of the world. So this part of Europe, I'm in the Netherlands, you're in the UK. So of course, if you're in the Ukraine, uh, you know, there, there, there are several places in the world, but it's not the of case, course. but our part of the world, I'm still here. Okay. Hey, we're having this wonderful conversation. We're reminiscing about, about Lurfens. It's great. But, you know, an hour later, you open your news app, you do some doom mm. scrolling, and you're in depression again. And this uh, going from a positive to negative to positive to negative emotion is very much uh, polycrisis behavior, polycrisis yeah. emotions. Um, and what you see happening in single crisis is that the whole society is going in one emotion. Remember the first wave of COVID when we went into lockdowns, everyone went into, oh my God, yeah. Anxious, depressed, then we all went into action mode. It's like, let's get out of here as fast as possible. Let's all collaborate, get a vaccine as fast as possible. Let's support all the vital and key work. So the whole society was going through the same emotions. Um, it's called the disaster response model at the same time. Now people are all over the place, which actually, from a leadership perspective, makes it very hard because as a, as a leader or, you know, just being a, a good colleague to the people around you is finding out where are my people and what do they need. Yeah. And now is everyone is all over the place. Um, so, so that's the first one. Mixed emotions. And you might think as a leader, they need this at this point, and then the next day they might feel completely different, or maybe the next hour. So from a people perspective, these are not the easiest times to be a, a good colleague, um, a good leader. Um, you, you, the empathy skills need to be through the roof, but, but maybe we can get to that. So that's one. The second is that um, uh, people are anxious and tired. Mm. Uh, remember the first wave of COVID? Everyone's action mode, let's go. The second wave is a bit less. The third wave is blah, 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 blah. Ukraine, <laughs> when the war started, we, we had our energies like, okay, let's help these Ukrainian refugees. That's and this right, wave, yeah. this action wave went through Europe, but then the war keeps going. And now when the Israel-Gaza conflict uh, broke out uh, October last year, people were almost a bit numb. It's like, okay, another war, another crisis. We have more refugees. We need more help. It's, it, people are tired. Um, anxious, tired. The mental health crisis is one one of the crises in the poly crisis. 
so that's the second. And the third is when it comes to change, and this is also for, for, for leaders and, and organizations a big one. When it comes to change, people say, really change right now? You know, I don't have the energy. I mean, come on. I, I, there might be another crisis around the corner any minute. Uh, I've celebrated a few times too early that we we came out of a crisis. Let let let's wait a bit. Let's hold our horses and 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 maybe you know the big change in a few months, maybe next year. Um, and this is different from a single like a normal normal crisis situation where people almost immediately go into action mode. Mm. Uh, and now it's like oh, okay, maybe action really. Um, so this is hard for organizations because, you know, they're all innovating AI. We're going to talk about that. You know, we need, we know we need to change. And, and a lot of leaders, uh, clients that I work with say, Timon, I'm trying to get this, this change through this innovation process that we're working on, but it's not going as fast as I want. Is, is it, is it the strategy? Is it the leadership? But maybe, but it's also the poly crisis, which slows you down. So, uh, these are the three main things. People are all over the place with their positive and negative emotions. They're tired. They're anxious. Combined, these two. And the third one, change. C- can we wait a bit? Next year, please. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, there's so much there to kind of to to pick up on. Right? But one of the things that kind of struck me and what uh, – and it <clears throat> in almost immediately at starting this conversation, I mean, I've been thinking about all these things that you've uh, that you've that you've mentioned. The – you're right. Just having an awareness of the fact that all these things going on in the world can affect us as individuals, uh, just mood, as you say, behavior. Um, and you, But you don't necessarily – that's not always at the forefront of your mind, is it? Particularly if you're around other people. You know, you start engaging no. with other people in a, on a day-to-day basis. And they don't have – no. unless you openly talk about it, you, they don't necessarily know that you might be – or been emotionally impacted by the uh, the stuff that's going on in the world. I certainly, my, the closest I got to it was when uh, there was, I think it was three or four years ago, uh, then there was the report that came out about the, the, the climate crisis and how we ah. have 12 years to sort it out, otherwise there's no turning back from it. And I remember just feeling awful about the you know like i remember going away for new year and just being in a terrible state um <laughs> just you know and then but, dan may i ask how old you how old so you I'm are 36 <laughs> 36 yeah. well you're actually you're actually in a good place because you know if we look at the research our youngsters uh and i'm talking about generation z so the under 27 yeah. 28 year olds are, are, are feeling this, this much worse than we i'm 46 uh than we do um so the impact of all this negativity about, you know, climate change, everything that's happening in the poly crisis is impacting them a lot, a lot more uh, than us uh, pointing of the, the over 35 yeah. pointing of us, yeah. of the oldies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's actually, so climate anxiety or a fear for the future are now actual proper anxieties um, uh, that you can get treatment for. Uh, if if uh, so, we're sidestepping here a little bit, and this is also part of the poly crisis. That when a poly crisis hits you when you're younger and you're in your so-called formative years, so between twelve and twenty-four is when the outside world is hardwiring you for the rest of your life. So what's happening between twelve and twenty-four years of age externally? That you know that that that's your blueprint for how you respond to different things when you get older. Um, so growing up in a poly crisis, we, we see that the majority uh, of young people in this part of the world, when they think about the future, uh, they're loaded. You know, it's loaded with fear and negativity. In the UK, for example, uh, a study came out a few months ago uh, where the respondents, uh, young people, again Gen Z, being asked, um, "All right, here's a statement: uh, Humanity is doomed." 56% of respondents agree to that statement. And that's a big difference from the 35 plus, 40 plus year olds, where, you know, my generation has a, a quite a positive outlook. In the future is loaded with positivity uh, because we grew up in a different time. Parenting styles were different. My parents said to me, the future will be bright, will be wonderful. And now parents are saying, whoo, 
If you're lucky, things will be the same, uh, yeah. but prepare yourself because things will probably get worse. And that is devastating for your outlook uh, into when the future. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's causing quite a lot of multi-generational conflicts where the different generations in the workplace don't understand each other yeah. uh, in, in, in how the crisis, the, the poly crisis perceived or even the work challenge, how you should approach that. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I, and I, I, cause I, again, I'm trying to reflect uh, and everything you're saying and, uh, yeah, just thinking about the way, cause the way, I mean, there, there was definitely conflict. There was definitely issues going on when we were between, in that age bracket, you know, 12 to 24, there was definitely, I wonder if just the, the sheer amount of, um, availability to that information though, uh, has, has, has come you know, just by, just with the invention of the internet and smartphones and everything else, you know, all yeah. of that, all of that information is, is sort of fed to us on a much more daily basis than having to turn the telly on at the news at the certain time of the day. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's no escaping of bad news. Even yeah. if you follow uh, crazy dance videos on TikTok and you scroll, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the Gaza Israel conflict will sip through. Yeah. Um, so that that's definitely impacting and uh, so the crisis that we've had when we were young uh, we all they've all re re resolved or gotten under control so yeah. in my formative years chernobyl awful disaster yeah. but we're still here cold war ended as a surprise even to the experts uh what else uh yugoslavia war peace treaty uh rwanda genocide a genocide but it actually ended so we experienced that coming to an end uh, and we, we haven't learned that from the history books uh, my favorite maybe the the year 2000 the the, the millennium bug the the, yes. uh, the all computers would stop working nothing happened yeah we did spend a few minutes nothing happened so we're worried because of nothing um and what was the last one Oh yeah, of course the the hole in the ozone layer. Yeah, right. Or the, layer, the yeah. acid the acid rain, climate problems in the nineteen nineties, and we solved them with technology. So yeah. my generation is hardwired. Hey, a climate problem. Maybe we can fix it with tech again. Uh, the year two thousand. Maybe we worry and nothing will happen. A cold War. We thought we're all you know it's it's going to be World War Three any minute now. But then surprisingly, it ended. So we're hardwired in a different way, uh, yeah. and most leaders my age your age of 35 plus don't realize they're hardwired in a different way and and um yeah so that's one of the things i do well help, yeah help I, old folks understand themselves a bit <laughs> so folks, they can be yeah, better yeah. leaders yeah uh, I've, I, honestly i felt i didn't feel old coming into this but you're certainly making me feel old <laughs> but sorry yeah that. so i sorry you're right that, no you're yeah. all right i'm only joking i'm only joking um my, uh, no having a three-year-old makes me feel old that's certainly mm. true um so yes, let's let's so let's focus. Uh, and, and you're right. And I, I'm fascinated by all of this, and I, I could definitely talk about it for a long time. But let's maybe look into uh, how it's looking at organisations and leaders specifically. We've sort of touched on it a little bit, but um, let's let's look at decision making processes for leaders and leadership action um, within an organisation. So let's let's maybe set a, a scenario. So. Um, presumably you're a, you're a leader of a team and, uh, the, the, um, and we and the news has just broken of a, of a new war, uh, as an idea, um, or, or there's some, or there's some new, new piece of information about the climate crisis and it's affected the team. What, what would you see as a sort of a top tip for leaders to kind of navigate that, um, well, a top tip is to actually talk about, uh, quite simple, about people's mental health. Uh, and again, if you're a bit older, mental health does not come naturally talking about that. Yeah. It actually to most, and it's mostly men, uh, not all, but it's mostly men. If I just, if I speak, whether it's a leadership training or in a conference, if you, if I use the word mental health for the first time, you see the body language go into, oh, it has a negative connotation. For young people, mental health, it's the same as physical health, right? I broke my arm. I had an anxiety uh, uh, issue this yeah. weekend. It's it's the same thing. <laughs> it, it, we're not, well, talking about hardwired and your youth, we have to learn this. And you can actually learn this, but you need to, to upskill uh, as a leader your EQ, emotionally intelligent yeah. skills. And that's yeah. being able to talk about mental health. 
Um, one of the things is to actually get help from a young person, some reverse mentoring. You know, I want to discuss mental health with the team. You know, this 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 just happened over the weekend, or uh, I've just read that. You know, uh, like the majority of my team is under thirty. I just read in the news that 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 they suffer from a fear for the, for the future. I want to discuss this. How can I do that best? And just be open about the fact that you don't know how to discuss this. So Monday morning, say, I'd love to talk about mental health and how you're doing, how you perceive the future, because we are here, uh, you know, I've, uh, you want to be a future-proof organization. I want to discuss this with you. How shall we do that? And there's some things you can do in the group, some things you have to do one-on-one. -on -one. But it's it's if you're a bit older and it doesn't come naturally to you, you need to upskill, get help, and, and, and be open about it, and, and maybe fail a little bit, but then... You know, that's part of your journey. Um, but this is on your leadership plate. Uh, and I see the response from most professionals. And again, pointing at myself, bit older, more male, is saying, all right, these youngsters, uh, they need some help. HR, uh, we need some help. So we outsource it to HR. And HR says, all right, let's add some outside coaches, counselors, professionals. So outsource, like a two-step. But it's time to insource, so back to HR. And HR should bounce this back to the leaders and say, all right, um, it's time for you to upskill and we're going to give you the tools, we're going to give you training, uh, you might need a reverse mentor, uh, and this is on your plate. And, and yes, there's too much on the plate of a, a, a manager leader these days, and this is extra, yeah, yes, that's the bad news, you can't outsource this anymore. Yeah. Um, and you need to take care of the mental well-being of course if someone's really suffering there should be a time for you to say all right so this is not for me you need external help but you need to be able to determine so this is something that you know i can help with and this is something too serious uh i'm gonna send you here and you can get the help you need um and it, it's rapidly changing. Uh, so this is, the, even in the world of construction, uh, we see a whole wave of mental health first aiders uh, yeah. uh, being trained on the job site. So these are hard hats. Uh, they used to have a, a first aid sticker on their hard hat. And now there's, you know, colleagues that are actually having a drill themselves and they're being trained to be mental health first aiders as well. Yeah. Not external, insourcing of mental health. Um, and taking the negative connotation away, very important. And it's and I, what I've kind of been interested there about is, you know, I do sort of look at the the older generation and the younger generation, and they're being um, they're being uh, more mental health, I suppose. Um, I don't want to say issues, but more mental health. I, I suppose issues is the only word I can think of right now, but. Um, it's certainly more prevalent in younger people than it is in older people. And I wonder if there's a bit of a sort of a resilience thing. Uh, and maybe, as you say, there, there was an element of upbringing that was different when we were in a younger age bracket. Um, but the, you can, and so maybe that was just the, the, the um, exposure to the bad news that had in it that we you know we had less ex potentially less exposure to that bad news but maybe also we just we were we were had, we had parents that just got on with stuff you know we there was acceptance yes. that things weren't brilliant but they just got on with it and now we kind of particularly in a western world in a in a in developed world we 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 don't we don't have direct exposure to war we don't necessarily have direct exposure to to famine necessarily that type of thing so Maybe it's just a case of it because there isn't those hardship times as much as there were as they used to be, that there isn't that natural resilience to to kind of get on with stuff. But I, I know that resilience is key to 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 people and and organizations. So how can how can business, I suppose, build that resilience to survive, not just to survive, sorry, but also thrive? Yes. So th there are a few things in here. So I, I hear a lot of, and I hear this one-on-one, -on -one, so not in group session that they say, Timon, you know, this young generation is just not resilient. Sometimes sure. they use the word snowflakes, right? We were resilient. They are yeah. snowflakes. I was careful. That's, I was careful. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. well, well, well done there. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, and I say that it's, it's just different. Uh, growing up in a poly crisis where your parents say things are not looking good, the climate news, constant bombarding. Um, so we have the parents to blame. We have social media to blame. We have the state of the world to blame. And then we say they're not resilient. They should toughen up. That's just not how it works. So maybe 
if you would measure resilience, they're a little bit less resilient, but it's a completely different time. So you can't compare yeah. the two. Yeah. Um, then you have the over-reporting. So that is that is a problem, the, the mental health language. So if someone is shy, which is just, you know, some people are shy, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, and then say, I have a social anxiety. No, you don't have a social anxiety. You're just shy, right? Um, or you have a presentation you have to do internally and you say, oh, I have an anxiety attack. No, you're just nervous. Everyone is nervous if they have yeah. to present for the first time in front of the college. It's just, you're just nervous. It's okay. You don't have a mental health problem or an anxiety and I need to send you to uh, a psychiatrist to get some pills. So there is a bit of mental, yeah, well, there, there's qu- quite some mental health language seeping into normal everyday behavior, everyday emotions, but you can only push back if you are, if you have the right EQ skills. If you don't educate yourself, but you cannot yeah. see what is the real anxiety attack and you need some help versus you're just nervous, let me help you. Um, so you need to be, you need some skills to see what's what, but you can't say it's all uh, BS uh, and it's all, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're just, you're all snowflakes. It's just yeah. not like that. No, so true. I hear mostly, or I uh, most many leaders say, uh, they take the approach, come on, it's just a crisis. Come on, it's just a presentation. Work hard, stay positive, get through this. When I was your age, no one listened to me the first five years I worked at this organization. I had no say. I had to do this. I had to work extra hours. I tried to complain and my boss didn't even listen to me. So they compare their own experience to, wait, which is 20, 30 years ago. You cannot yeah. compare the two. That's so if true. you say, toughen up, get through this, stay positive, follow my lead, they're gone, right? You lose them. We're talking about, you know, the, the talent is just gone. They don't want to work for you. They feel bad. They leave, um, and what often happens is if they leave, they say they do that because they they, they uh, get a better salary somewhere else. Sure. Um, and they say, oh, they're so greedy, uh, you know, they can earn a uh, hundred quid more at that company. No, they're not. You were, you know, you were an, a miserable boss. There was an awful culture, but they don't say that. They say, I'm leaving because I can make some more money there. But the true reason is that yeah. you were an awful boss. But if they say that to you, they get into a whole conversation they don't want to. So you can try to fight this and try to stick to the old ways of work hard, stay positive, be resilient, come on, uh, stop complaining. And, and But that doesn't work. Uh, if you want to have a sustainable and then sustainable incentive of work culture, you know, where it's sustainable, you, get, you attract talent, you keep talent, um, uh, you you need to get with the program instead of resist it. Um, and if you educate yourself, you can push back on some things because that's what young people need as well. They're, you know, just if you're, you're a parent of a three-year-old, sometimes yeah. you go, sometimes you need to, you yeah. need to push back. So yeah, leaders do true. have to push back a bit on this as well. Yeah. So don't don't take everything they say. I feel bad. Okay. Oh, so we're so sorry. We'll say no. I need yeah. a day off because I feel so. No. Yeah. Some days say no. Sorry. This is what you need. To, but you need to educate yourself as a manager, as a leader, uh, and then you can do that with confidence. Yeah, I think it's, it's, education is key, isn't it? For a, for a yes. lot of it, and I think. Um, the, and I, I suppose that it can it in itself be overwhelming at present because there is so much that I feel that we need to kind of learn about that there's almost yeah there's almost too much to to learn about because there's every, there's everything to learn all of the well, time. The leaders are in the in the poly crisis as well, so they are also tired. They also experience these mixed emotions. They also are resistant of change. So if you say to them you need to you know upskill your EQ skills, it's like oh really maybe yeah. next year I'll have some energy. So it's sure. it's the same. They resist the change as well. So yeah. we're in the same boat. No, it's fascinating, I, and I could ask many more, many more questions. But I'm going to move on to my next one because it's we've, yes. we've we are, are, only because we've, we're going to segue quite nicely because on the subject of education, um, a big thing that is, and we, we've already talked a bit about technology, and you've and you've mentioned about AI. So the 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 pace of change of AI is, I mean, exponential. Doesn't feel like it covers it quite with AI, the rapid the rapid kind of development with AI. And it's um, and it's certainly not going anywhere anytime soon. So uh, we, the a recent podcast guest actually described it as the start of a new era uh, as AI becomes more prevalent in everyday life. So I'm curious to know about your research and conversations. 
What have you seen as the biggest themes and the changing in the changing role of technology? Well, on the topic of AI, all my clients ask me about this. All leaders ask me about, all right, you know, the, the whole organization is looking at leaders. All right, so this, a, you know, the AI, which is a very broad... <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. So uh, the employees are looking at the, the leadership. All right, what are we going to do? And, and, and they don't know. The, the experts don't know exactly what place this will find in, you know, many different organizations, many different applications. We don't know yet. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like when the internet came. All right, you know, 1995. Yeah. It's a bit like, okay, so what does this mean? Uh, it's probably going to take a decade before we find out. And and the question is, all right, are you going to experiment and fail? Are you going to experiment and and fail and you know get bad press? Um, we don't know yet. Uh, where I, it, my current perspective on it, it's it's a tool, uh, a bit like a calculator uh, on your desk. I had a conversation with a super smart lady from IBM. He said, we, we see this as a tool to do your work a bit better and a bit faster. Replacing human beings? No, replacing some tasks. But then it's always what we always overestimate that when the task gets taken away, that suddenly means you'll be, you know, so if, if half of your job is being outsourced to AI, does it mean you can fire half your people? Often it goes gradual and, and we fill up that, that time with other tasks. So... I am not too scared that suddenly, you know, half of knowledge professionals will lose their jobs. It's always when a new technology comes that we think we'll be unemployed. Yeah. It never happens. It never happens. Uh, I do things over time. Uh, we'll, we'll outsource some of our thinking. A bit like I calculate. We, we'll outsource this to AI. Uh, but it, it will be a tool on our desk. And we'll ask it questions. We'll be smarter. We'll have a boardroom meeting. We'll think of the strategy of impact. Learn fest. 2025, what shall we <laughs> yeah. program? Uh, Chat GPT, what do you think? Some brilliant ideas and we have a chat and it, it will be a conversation partner uh, and the brainstorm will be a bit faster, but it's not, uh, all right, make a program and 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 we're going to fire the whole team that normally will put this together. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not too worried there. On the other side of that, uh, if we lose a few people, I think great, because there is a big shortage here in this part of the world, nurses, teachers, uh, people who actually put all the solar panels on our roofs, right? Construction workers, mental health professionals. There are yeah. so there are so many industries which need qualified uh, That's a good people. way of thinking about it, yeah. And you're sitting in an office typing away, you're an accountant or something, and now AI is going to, you know, become a... <laughs> do something else. so it's not that yeah so i'm not too worried I, I i i actually hope that we'll get a few people out of knowledge work actually installing solar panels making smart grids work for us um yeah. nursing homes do work that is actually satisfying uh and you actually help a human being and you don't help you know a balance sheet uh <laughs> Uh, uh, there, there was a great uh, speaking of resilience and to do with AI. There was a great poster. I think it was or a billboard. I think it was in New York actually, and I I, I haven't got the wording completely right because I haven't got it to hand. But the there was something like go on then AI, AI finish this scaffold or finish this billboard or something. Yeah. And it's, so there are so yeah. So it's a lovely kind of view of like uh, the, I suppose the resilience of of humans against like that that moving over that fear of what what ai could and and replace humanity you know and and let's go for four day a week <laughs> four day work week why not yeah. the experience have been there in the uk for example last year and productivity went up so much that uh, there was hardly any difference between the five day wor workers and the four day workers so give people an extra day great if i could do that i don't think it's going to happen yeah. uh looking at the history but that'd be great let's all work four days um, and we can you, we can be happier, be great for our mental health, and productivity doesn't have to. Yeah, suffer. I think that's true. I think there's uh, like there, there's there is. I mean, I, I am torn between uh, with AI at the moment because, of course, it it's not going anywhere. And like you say, we were we will have had these exact feelings when the internet came out for sure. We definitely Everything. did. Um, and I am torn. I do think there are there are definite negatives to it. As uh, what, for what us. Are you what are you afraid of then? Well, not, I'm not, the not so much afraid of. It's more, uh, it, it, uh, well, I don't think it is, but maybe it is. But the, I think 
with with technology generally, I think we're all getting slightly lazier as human beings, um, mm. and I think that that's only going to get exacerbated with AI. You know, if we if we don't have to, I mean, if we don't have to do certain things anymore that we would do normally, which already it's already happened a bit um, over the years. But that if, if we if if that gets to the point where we don't have to think as much anymore, I mean, we already don't think as much. There's just one step removed between typing out a question in Google on your phone versus asking it. And well, you can already do that to a, to a degree. But yeah, I mean, where does it end? Do we get like, will there, will it be a point where an AI connected implant goes into, I mean, I think Mr. Musk is already thinking about it, but the, you know, well, like I, if, <laughs> where, where do we, and then what do we, we do, we're just getting ever closer to the, uh, the beings that are in the film up, not up, uh, Wally, uh, sorry, oh, <laughs> I got Wally. The wrong, wrong Disney film. Uh, uh, oops, very different. But yeah, you know what I mean. It's like there, there it's, it's. Uh, All right, I, I, well, I, if we if we get fully philosophical, I think if AI gets so smart, they'll know what's good for us, right? Because we'll program it to say, I, "I want you to make me as happy you'd as hope possible." So. You'd certainly hope yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. what makes us happy is actually the, the thing that makes me most happy is social connection, right? Yeah, it's not the snack or the entertainment it's actually connecting with with people now if there's one big problem let me hold up my smartphone that's standing in between people connecting it's a smartphone if you look sure. at teenagers in, in, yeah, in yeah. schools if i look at conferences coffee break ladies and gentlemen what does 80 90 percent of the the audience do yeah boom phone yeah, goes up it down. used to be in the old days it's people have a conversation will network it's still there but it's less so yeah. I think if AI gets really smart, they will give us actually the social media. I think it's, we're living in a time of anti-social media. They gave us, they will give us truly social media. They will, they won't distract us, and they give us what we want. And Wally yeah. is is if that that's dumb AI. Give you snacks <laughs> and and movies that doesn't make us happy. Yeah, that's so, true. I mean, uh, I, again, like I say, I, I'm uh, slightly conflicted because, of course, where where AI does have its threats, it also has po huge potential. I mean, we could think about how it could uh, speed up the process of um, uh, of medic medical care uh, yeah. and medical research. We could find a cure for cancer. We could find a cure for, as you've said, uh, for the climate crisis. You know, just just through sped up um, technological. Uh, Thinking, I suppose, is another way of putting it. But yeah, so there's. I, I, I'm, I'm more. There's I'm more worried about uh, tech addiction. So uh, tech standing in between us as people, that then AI doing some smart decision making for us. That, yeah. So, but that's that's my personal perspective. Eh? So. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I've kind of we've totally sidestepped my next uh, official question, <laughs> which was. Sorry about that. Uh, but no, no. But it's totally true. We've kind of covered yeah. it. Which is, of course, is there a threat of organizations becoming less human because of ai so i suppose we've we have kind of talked about that uh but we've not really looked at it the lens of organizations so you know i, I i've asked the question with ai being the way it is you know is uh, this is in a previous episode but looking at towards hr you know hr as a function in theory could become uh less about the h part of an organization in the, the human so uh so I suppose, yeah. Uh, what what would you say to that? Well, if it's about salaries and and putting everything in an Excel sheet, there we go. AI can do that. But if you, for example, if you talk what you do at Impact is like training professionals, leadership training, developing your EQ skills. That, that's still people are going to do that. It's not that we're going to listen to yeah. you know Siri four point uh, and that being trained. Uh, an implant in your brain so you suddenly are the best. That's so far away, and I don't think that's going to happen um, because we humanity pushes back when technology that's, goes too that far. Is that is true. Um, I, I sometimes take the example of an airplane flying on autopilot, which is technically possible and probably safer if you look at all the statistics and the data, but then would people step aboard of a plane where there's no human beings? A driverless in the plane, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we're pushing back. the concept back. of driverless cars, aren't they, right? Yeah, it's emotion, that, that's an emotional pushback. So um, <laughs> now I'm losing. Yeah, all right, so, so uh, I think, no, I, I wouldn't be worried as an HR professional. I, I think your skills in... Um, 
you know, your number skills or, you know, I have to draft a job opening LinkedIn, the text, it's like, all right, we've had a, a thousand job openings in the past. Now make a perfect one. I'll put three or four things, click, there's the perfect job opening post. That will go fast. Uh, maybe the first round of job interviews will be outsourced to AI, but the second and the third round will still be with the human being because you still have to have a conversation. And so th- some things will be, fu- but then it makes room for other things. And and I'm actually excited for the, uh, if, if you look at doctors these days, they all complain about how many administrative tasks they have to do. They say, I actually see patients 50% of the time. The other half is spent on filling out forms, yeah. putting everything in the computer. All doctors complain about that. And many managers do as well, right? It takes so much time putting everything, drafting the emails, sending that, making the calculation. Please, can AI come to to fast forward that so we can actually have a proper conversation? I can spend time with my patients. I can actually do the job interview myself I- instead of outsourcing that to someone who's who's not really trained to do that. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm not worried at all I'm, yeah. <laughs> when it well, comes to very, the HR function. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it's been fascinating hearing you talk and kind of getting an insight about how about how you approach it, uh, approach new things that happen all the time. Um, there, there are a few jobs. And- like if you're an interpreter, right? <laughs> there are, you know, there, there's less work. If you are a logo designer, right? So the best ones will still be human and they might use AI as a tool, but there's a whole, you know, if you starting your own little scaffolding surface in a rural town and you need a logo now you can go to dali get me a logo for my mini scaffolding yeah. one person business it, 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 that's that's that that little job is good. so there are a few jobs gone indeed but if we look at the big picture ah. yeah that's true that's very true it, uh, and yeah uh it uh, the, the, the uh, there's always been jobs like that that have been um replaced i suppose by technology i mean you just look back within the past hundred years and think about how many how many that's already happened to um my next question is a kind of an interesting one because we've clearly talked a lot about the various different things in this past 40 minutes uh and to kind of i suppose in some way summarize you know you're a global keynote speaker invited by multinational household name organizations to share your insights and inspire their teams. So what are the topics and emerging trends that businesses are asking you that we've not already covered? And does anything does anything take you by surprise these days? Ooh, um, well, the big themes are, you know, the, the, the state of the world, uh, yeah. mental health, is suddenly before COVID, there was already on our radio, we wanted to talk about it, it couldn't sell it as a topic. If you put it in a proposal, they say, no, take that out. So like, from being like, no, we don't want you to talk about to yes, please. Uh, the next generation keeps, and, and the interesting thing is, so these multi-generational, what, what surprises me is that you you feel like I've been, I've been speaking on millennials 15 years ago and i sometimes have a feeling it's a bit like groundhog day right so it's the old generation talking about the youngsters and they complain there are different nuances but it's always and the youngsters say oh my boss doesn't understand me the world has changed so um i think with the whole generational thing it it feels like groundhog day and it's like using the same arguments in a little bit of a different form same goes with technology uh if you look throughout history the fears surrounding new technology whatever it is (laughs) Uh, it, it it feels like a bit on repeat. Um, I I think the the uh, what I like is that the complete positivity about tech. So the twenty tens uh, were about all right. We're going to get wearables. We're going to get uh, big data, uh, the Internet of Things. So there was a lot of positivity. Social media, right? So there, so um, I get more questions about the downside. Uh, when it comes to all the new tech, and you you, you see that with the AI, AI yeah. conversation we just had, so I and that actually surprised me a bit. Is that I see now with leaders, I see now with organizations that it's shifting a bit. Instead of yes, 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 let's gather as much data as we can, uh, we're gonna hyper customize everything and privacy. It's just a little hurdle, and it's mass personalization and the Internet of Things. We're gonna put a sensor on everything, measure everything, uh, everything will be connected. Um, we, we've come back from that. And I think 
that's actually a good thing. But it surprised me how fast this went. Uh, but it also has to do with our mental health. You know, we're a bit anxious, like you said in the beginning. People are anxious. So when, you know, do new technology, it's a bit like, really? Sure. Um, <laughs> so that surprised me that we went from the positive 2010s to the, when it comes to technology, to the more negative and cautious 2020s, which is actually slowing things down. That's really interesting. Fascinating insight. Um, and I, I could keep talking you, to you for hours. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I realize yeah. we haven't got the time to do that. Um, yes. So to close off then, uh, let's ask you our final question, which we ask all of our guests, which is the if you were to start your career again, um, what would be the best piece of advice you'd give yourself? Well, actually, so uh, I always liked speaking, even at university. So I got my best grades when I had to present something instead of high- handing in a written report. Yeah. And uh, in all my roles that I've had, I won't go into that. Uh, I always did a little bit of speaking, but I always thought it was a side hustle. It's something you do on the side. And when I was 35, so 11 years ago, I became full-time speaker, full-time trainer, standing in front of groups only. And I, I, I never realized that that could be a profession. So, you know, you can write as a profession, you can research as a profession, you can uh, film, broad, everything. But speaking as just doing that and, and the advice then would be is uh, uh, this can be this can be a career. So start upskilling your speaking skills, um, your moderating skills, everything that has to do with live groups of people, because I wasn't aware of that until I was 34. And I was like, oh, you can do this for this could be a job. Um, <laughs> and I wish I'd known that early bit, and then maybe not career wise, but just have that in the back of my mind as something in, you know, in the future that I could, I could do full time because that that's what I like doing best. Well, I mean, some would say that it's all part of the journey, right? So you kind of get there and, it, and it, you got there at the right time because it's exactly where you needed to be, right? That's I just got lucky. Or, you, Dan, yeah, I have yeah. to say, I, 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 I got lucky. So I, I, I met, someone who opened the door for me and and put a mirror in front of me said you could do this so if i uh so so sometimes you have to get lucky in life so part of the journey but yes you have to get lucky on the way so that's i uh, couldn't agree yes. more couldn't agree more well uh timon that's been uh, uh absolutely wonderful thank you ever so much for giving us your time uh and i'm sh- uh, what an energetic episode and and certainly lots to lots to think about and learn more about um and so i'm very grateful to you to, to spending time with us today so thank you very much um, thank you dan it, it yeah. was a pleasure thank you well yeah no it's been absolutely wonderful and that just leaves me to say that if you would like to find out any more about either impact or timon or myself then you'll find all of the links that you need uh, in the description if you haven't yet seen our back catalogue of previous episodes then we'll leave all of the links that you need in that description so be sure to follow for more uh Uh, and we will uh, see you on the next episode of In Good Company. So until the next time, take care.